All right. Hi, my name is Rich Schmidt. I'm here with Becky Wasserman Hone. Uh, it's February 22nd, 2021. Uh, Becky's joining us via Zoom from her home in France. Uh, Becky, thank you so much uh, for joining us today. We really appreciate this. Um, also joining us today is Tia Elder. She's uh, joining in this conversation as well. So Becky, thank you again. Uh, first question for you, and the most important question of all, is why wine? Why wine? Uh, I don't want to say that I fell into a vat or anything like that, but uh, there, I've always been interested, even as a little girl, in um, French food and wine. I grew up in New York. I went to actually a Rudolf Steiner school, though there was no talk about wine. And just to me, it seemed as soon as I could read French novels and what have you, just a very romantic concept. It was much better than a dry martini, you know. Um, so uh, th that was, if you will, the initial interest. And then um, I've been married three times. Sorry, I hope it doesn't shock the archive listeners. But the first time I was married, I was quite young. And uh, my husband was up at Harvard. And there was just quite a re remarkable man who had lived in France for a while and introduced a number of us to wine. But the first bottle I ever bought was a Rosé Mateus. That seemed at the time to be very sophisticated. <laughs> so interest in wine, uh, husband number two um, put together a cellar. And then we moved um, to Burgundy in 1968. And if you will, that at that time, uh, I didn't go on tastings or anything like that. I was definitely a uh, um, stay at home wife, if you will. And I was known for my cooking and how well I washed and dried wine glasses. This was <laughs> not to be my destiny, though I can still polish a glass. And really got into the business of it uh, by necessity. All right, so we'll get back to that in a second, but I'm curious um, what, why the move to Burgundy uh, in the first place? And, and at what point did you start kind of learning more about wine? Uh, well, I'd read and read and read. I, I have too many books anyway, but moved uh, to Burgundy because Wasserman uh, was an artist and he actually wanted to stay away from the politics of art, you know, how you get a show in a museum, so on and so forth. And we had a French student who was boarding with us in Philadelphia and he said, oh, you know, you like wine and food, why don't you go to Burgundy? Happened that way, rented a house for the first summer and then uh, found a place, you know, sort of an old farm where um, he could have a studio and uh, convert the farm into a house, etc. So that's how we got to Burgundy with my mother and my two sons. <laughs> Tell me about that experience of, of picking up your life and moving to Burgundy. Well, I love the country side, you see, because when I was young and before the polio vaccine had been um, produced, I was sent away from New York, like many other children in the summers, um, to a, first of all, to a little farm community and then to a small town. And I absolutely loved the country. So for me, <laughs> it was, it was just a joy. Very glad to get out of cities. Mm. And the adjustment was, well, it was way back in 68. It was before supermarkets. It was, you know, uh, very different, interesting world. Tell me about getting back, you talk about kind of acclimatized to that. Tell me about sort of the adjustment from, from being in the city for some of your adult life into that back in the countryside in a new country, uh, learning the language, learning the customs of, of France. Did that take a while or were you pretty much home? No, it, it didn't. You know, I was lucky having gone to Rudolf Schneider School um, where you, all, you learned a language other than English and there was a European feel about it. And my mother was European. So it was, uh, how can I sort of think about it? It was just, it, it was just right. It felt right. 
Yes, there were, um, I spoke French, I had in high school, went to high school in New York, um, excellent French teacher, so I could speak and read French, you know, not in a perfect way, but the language wasn't strange for me, and uh, from time to time one would make a whopping mistake, absolutely whopping <laughs> mistake, but uh, other than that, uh, and then because I'd read so much, um, the adjustment was not unexpected. We were the curiosities then. Oh, the Americans. Oh, you know, this, that, and the other thing. There were very few Americans there at that time. And um, Wasserman, uh, gosh, fell in with um, some growers rather quickly. And, you know, it was a lot, a lot to do. Wine was the, uh, evidently, the activity of the region. And this was, you know, back in the time of innocence. So, but as I say, I cooked and washed and dried the wine glasses. I did taste once. And we were living in saint Omar in a village and the mayor of the village did, you know, have a winery. And so I went down and I didn't realize that you should spit. The spitting for Americans is impolite and it could, you know, <laughs> you could get a fine for it. So I swallowed everything, nobody said anything. And I suddenly realized I was drunk. And I went up the hill, a house was a little bit up the hill, holding onto the sides of buildings. I got home, my mother was so mad. She was so angry. But anyway, that was my first in cellar tasting. <laughs> but anyway. Did you, did you find yourself at that time enjoying wine? Uh, you, you mentioned learning about it. Did you actually enjoy drinking it, enjoy tasting it at that point? Oh, yes, because um, I already, when we were living, uh, first of all, in Cambridge, and then, uh, you know, living after that in Philadelphia, um, I already had quite a collection of cookbooks. And I loved food and wine. I just loved the whole idea of it, the generosity of it, the hospitality of it. So it was, um, you, one learns all the time. I mean, I'm 84 and still learning things. So, you know, it's not, uh, the mind never closes if you don't, you know, if you don't want it to. And gosh, um, no, it was, it was remarkable for someone. You know, Philadelphia had a farmer's market and an Italian market. So one could get good produce, but to be in France was another story. You know, the cheese shops, the this, the that, it was, it was, you know, sort of Christmas and New Year's all rolled into one every day. So you mentioned earlier that you got into the wine industry out of necessity. So to yeah. tell, us that, tell us that story and tell us how you ended up and where your first, kind of first stop was in the industry. Um, Mr. Wasserman was an artist and sometimes artists have interesting personalities. And he collected wines, he collected au pair girls, and I got fed up. And I wanted to become independent, but you know, I, I, when I'd worked in the United States, I'd worked as a copywriter and what have you, but I was, you know, sort of a, uh, you know, stay at home mom and wife and all of that. And there was a particularly, <laughs> oh gosh, um, there was a mistress in residence. And so, Peter and Paul and I, my sons and I, were sent off to the United States. So the mistress could have, you know, a free run of things. And very interestingly enough, we visited New York. We, we visited, I had one of the au pair girls, not a mistress au pair girl, um, but a Montana woman. And then we went to California because we'd had visitors. Uh, because of the, you know, good table one set and everything like that, uh, just people would sort of show up. And so I, I'd met people in California and we went there and somebody said to me, oh gosh, um, wow, you know, we're a producing state, of course, uh, but do you know of any small growers who might let, let, like to export their wines? That was step one. Step two was Yellowstone Park in Montana, where um, I found that if I wanted to, I could stay with the boys and get a job doing, how can you, you know, boeuf bourguignon, this would have been bison bourguignon. And <laughs> somehow the weather prospect was a bit cold, so we came back. 
And coincidentally, uh, the cooperage industry was not in good nick because of you know, various uh, economic factors. And um, Jean-Francois, who lived in Saint-Romain, Francois Frere, said, oh, you've been in California. Do you think you could sell a few barrels for me? And that's really how it started. I got permission from Mr. Wasserman um, because I said, oh, it's you know, be extra money and all of that kind of thing. And so the year, I guess it was, was it the, I can't remember exactly at what time, but the Francoise made me a small barrel and off I went with the, not the banjo on my knee, but the barrel on my knee and uh, into California. So that was how it all started. Was that your, when you first went to California and that trip, was that your first visit to the West Coast? Uh, second visit to the West Coast, but really um, it was marvelous because I went with children the second time and you saw it in another way. And then I was introduced um, to a California winery, which would have been Joseph Phelps. And because the people I was staying with were friends there. And, you know, sometimes timing is everything. All right, what then happened was, yes, there were a few people interested in barrels. And what was the key to everything is a very down to earth concept. It's not palate or, you know, uh, but how do you get wines, should one do something with them from point A to point B? And because with the barrels, what I learned was groupage. That is to say, nobody was going to, people wanted to try barrels. I was working both for um, uh, Francois and Jean Tarenceau at the time, and somebody wanted three barrels of this, somebody wanted eight barrels of Nevers, nine barrels of Trancé, or we'll take 20 barrels, of, you know, so on and so forth. But they had to be delivered to one California estate, and then people would come and pick up their twos, their threes, their 95s, and so on and so forth. So that really was the key because had one not learned to do that very down to earth thing, one could never have shipped wines from small producers. And there I must say the shipping companies, even the truckers were so, so helpful. So helpful because uh, for instance, one of the things I learned uh, was that if a trucker goes to pick up, let's say, 22 cases of a particular wine and the trucker arrives and there's only a grandmother and a four-year-old the trucker is not required to load the truck just details like that so perhaps the most fascinating thing of all was learning how things work you know how things work and uh, so that was really the start of it all and I saw uh, that if no one else was um, you know hanging around with barrels or anything and small producers were not being exported so the timing was everything i was lucky very very lucky and also working like that i'd be in the vineyards i i learned i learned from the ground up you know and and then uh it was so interesting uh uh because people back then also had time and I'm sure you, you have the feeling today that there's less and less time or there was pre-COVID. You know, just very rough, appointments here, appointments there. And growers here in Burgundy would spend hours with you in the vineyards, in the cellars, and the California and Oregon winemakers were the same. There was no, it was a different world. There was no social media there. <laughs> so that's how it all started. And... Uh, I was very uh, fortunate in that the time was right. The time was right. And also my motivation was very serious. I wanted to become financially independent and you know, able to leave what, what was a difficult marriage. So you're getting an interesting, you said an interesting education uh, from the wine industry, from the from the people inside it in two different yeah. regions. Tell me yeah. about the, the sort of the similarities and differences as you were meeting French producers and meeting California producers. What 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 were the kind of through lines between the two industries and what was different about them? 
um, the French uh, producers I met were small, small domain, small estates. And I did meet some very large estates in California, i.e. very friendly with Zelma Long, who was uh, uh, the enologist at Moldavi, which was a different thing. Yet between everybody, there was still, I look back at it with great nostalgia, there was this innocence. And I remember when I took uh, Jean-Francois to uh, uh, California for, for the barrels and the Moldavis put on a splendid lunch. Um, and we went with a friend of Jean-Francois uh, who was a man who was known in France as an expert. That is to say, be, he would be brought into court and he could tell you where a wine came from. And I remember sitting, I'll never forget, it's one of the things I'll never forget, uh, you know, at a Moldavi luncheon with Zelma and, and I think Robert Moldavi was there and maybe Tim or Michael. And Monsieur, the, the fellow said, I, this wine comes from the same plot as that wine. The same terroir, if you will, the word wasn't used back then. And effectively, it was from uh, vineyards owned by René de Rosa, who, you know, is certainly was known for that. And when people heard that, uh, this was the old fellow was Monsieur Vacheron, and his children had a domain in Sancerre, he could tell, we were invited everywhere, so that, that he would identify with extraordinary accuracy. But you know, Mondavi was big. I mean, I knew smaller estates in California and of course in Oregon. And so it was very, the attitude was the same. The attitude was not big biz at all. It was how can we survive? I remember, you know, going to William Sellium, which was, took place in a shack. It took place in a shack. And, you know, Dick Graff, sort of up on a mountain uh, <laughs> with his dog and ancestor portraits. There was a great deal of interest back then and, and, and wonderful thoughts. There were nurseries, you know, where people were trying to uh, grow, um, you know, different, you, you know, rootstocks and what have you. And I just loved all that part of it. I loved all that part of it. It was, yes, it was pre-Parker, it was before, it was a, a precious moment back then. So then, you know, I had my barrels and I had, uh, <laughs> I had a little bit of, um, I started to export a little bit of wine, very little, just I had an importer in Chicago and uh, one in California. And then it was trial and error. And then I had some, um, I had some jobs that we don't need to talk about. <laughs> Though I was agent for some people, I didn't know what I was doing, and I did not know how to earn money in a way. The the Coopers, not a problem, but people who wanted me to find things for them, I, I didn't know what to ask. I, you know, so I proceeded <laughs> make a number of mistakes. Oh well. <laughs> Part of life, I suppose. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> tell me, tell me about the the importing side of things, the importing exporting side of things. At that point, obviously, that's that's kind of foreshadowing what you're going to be be doing for, with your career. Tell me about learning that, uh, about finding finding the right the white bring things wines to bring in, the right places to bring them to, the right clients, the right customers. Trial uh, and well, trial well, and error. It took an importer first who was interested in small demands. So you you already had uh, you you know people with. Uh, a few importers were, who were really, I don't know, maybe they sensed that small was beautiful, you know, or, or what have you. So it was that sort of thing. They weren't looking for product. You know, they were looking for uh, um, honest wines really. And so one was approached, you didn't write letters. When I was selling barrels, um, there used to be a publication called Wines and Vines. And I remember my son sitting when they were little boys and we addressed envelopes to every going winery in California. You know, you didn't have faxes, <laughs> it was a mailed letter. 
And, but there was nothing like that as far as importers went. So people would hear, you know, that there might be something and so on and so forth and uh, get in touch with you. And then you'd sort of, I, I just found my first order book back in 77, my God. <laughs> You know, and it's 20 cases of this and so on and so forth. And then one would write them up. And I think uh, we had actually, my son Paul was here. He, he had been in school in Paris and he came back down. And we invented this one page, which would be very useful today when I think of it. It had um, uh, one side, it had a history of the domain, you know, started in what year. A uh, tiny little paragraph about the winemaker, the winemaker's family, um, an anecdote and a recipe. And we used to send those out. And I keep thinking it might be very useful today with all the blah, blah that's going on, you know? So that was how we sort of, and so you would apply, you would send your, um, you, you would send your um, um, sort of page and what have you, you know, and a yearly catalog to the few importers you had. And then you would go and work the market. Hmm? That's what you did, you worked the market. That's what it was called. You learned how to get dressed in telephone booths. If you took an overnight plane from California to Chicago, you didn't have time to go to a hotel. You had to, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> yeah. So that was really the way it worked. And then I took every extra job I could take and so I finally ended up with someone who had a company in Bordeaux and we were uh, for a number of years, Canaan and Washington. We did the whole United States, you know, from state to state, from region to region. Um, and uh, the barrels I stopped working with because um, it was a moment where New Oak was a fad, you know, it lasted 10 years, it was a fad, but I found, wines were a bit too oaky in America and you couldn't ethically sell barrels and then say that a wine was too oaky. So I had to stop. So that was another financial loss, <laughs> but learning process, learning process. <laughs> yeah. You, you talked about working the market. Tell me what the market looked like in those days for, especially for imported wine. Was there a high demand for these small domains no. in, in France? No, um, we were very, uh, one, one was very lucky if you found a retailer who was interested in having you do a tasting um, or if there was a local writer who had perhaps been to Europe and what have you. No, uh, Pinot Noir was considered to be an absolute disaster of a grape. Um, uh, Chardonnay had not become Chard then. And my first wine list also had wines from the South, you know, it was a, a small list and, and unfashionable appellations. I had first list, I can't find a copy of it. I haven't gone through all the archives yet. Um, I had five saint Aubans. Nobody had ever heard of saint Aubin, <laughs> where it was and so on and so forth. People loved Pomar, they'd always heard of Pomar. Vone, woman's wine. So it was a whole thing, but if you had good, good wines, then you know there'd be either a small audience or there'd be a larger audience and uh, um, you, you you would have them taste and you know you would tell them what you ate with it um, i'm glad that's coming back because it's very important the wine just doesn't exist well some do you know on their own but mm. so that was working the market and uh you would start if you were lucky early in the morning wherever you were whatever part of the states you were in and you would finish by midnight and you get up the next day and do it again. It was not, uh, it's so sweet because you have people who come to visit you and they say, oh, how glamorous. No, it was as far away from glamorous as you could get. It was just, you know, hard work. Hard work, gratifying because you were representing um, domains that you admired. So in that sense, you know, it had, nothing to do with pushing toothpaste I, because you, you, you know, you, you really uh, felt very close to the people you worked with. And then it went a little bit more quickly. And I had the great good fortune. Of, I think we were only 
three women in the trade. It was Martine Saunier, you know, who was French. And, uh, and then there was one woman sommelier in Detroit, Madeleine Trifon. And that's all we were. So from time to time, you got an article because you were a curiosity and the journalist had nothing else to write about. So that also was um, positive at that time, timing again. And then I worked with uh, Christopher Canaan. We were Canaan and Wasserman for X number of years. And then there was a whale of a bankruptcy in New York and um, uh, they wanted to take over and being, I'm a Capricorn, I'm stubborn. I did not wish to be taken over. And so went out on, we went out on our own. <laughs> Scary. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine, I'm gonna, I'm gonna come back to that in a second, but I have a question about something you mentioned a second ago. Okay. With, uh, you talked about the, the cards you created, the sheets you created with the information about, about these wineries. Yes. At, at that point, what did you, what did you feel was the, the biggest selling point of a wine? Was it the taste of the wine? Was it the story of the wine? What, what was the biggest thing for you to get a wine? Oh, people, a people had to like the taste evidently because people did not come to not like wine. They came with at least an open mind. And what was very interesting for, uh, for the drinking public at that time uh, were of course the stories because you know, when, when they hadn't realized it was such a, physical act, you know, that uh, uh, a grower really did work, you know, in certain seasons from sunrise to sunset. They hadn't, they hadn't really thought about that. And a little bit of history and an anecdote. You know, anecdotes are marvelous. There was one fellow in uh, Alux Corton, and when I went to visit him, I didn't know if I was going to work with him or not, uh, he handed me a soup spoon. And off we go into the vineyard. And he had me taste the soil for a specific reason, not geologically, but when he had to stop school when he was 12. And he knew he would follow the horse and he would know when you went from sandy soil to rocky soil and vice versa. You know, because the horse would either strain or the horse would, it was, there was lots of stuff people still remembered horses. And there was one grower who, um, my gosh, his family really began to make good wine when they could afford to buy a horse instead of rent time on a horse. Because the horse owner gave a little bit more money, you get the choice. But this had, you know, if you wanted to do this or that at proper timing and you didn't have your own horse. So imagine the change, you know, from this old fellow who started out with a horse and now the retractors that you owned, that you borrowed in order to purchase. So all of this, you know, again. So how, what was the most important? The most important was being at customer tastings. That was important. If you got a good story in the press um, that, you know, sort of your importers would be happy but the most important was doing tastings. Doing tastings and, and not boring people, not droning on <laughs> and liking to do that. It, it's, it's interesting the parallels between the, the, your, your, your glamorous life and, and the glamorous life of the people whose wines you're selling, right? It seems, it seems glamorous, but a lot of hard work, a lot of, a lot of, and you have to love it, right? Like you say, you have to really exactly. love it. Exactly, you, you have to love it because uh, glamour is an odd word and, you know, has to do with dressing up. And, you know, of course, if in the wine trade, I've been for many years, you don't wear perfume, you don't wear lipstick because <laughs> it would interfere with the, <laughs> the smell and the taste. Do you meet interesting people? Of course you do, Burgundy has always, been where we live has been sort of a magnet for people who like the smallness of it. But otherwise, it, it's it's all very down to earth and and uh, a different now with social media. I mean, the fact that you and I can talk to each other 
is amazing. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, you mentioned uh, you mentioned something that I was going to ask you later on in the interview, but since you brought it up already, you, you talked about uh, being one of the very few women in your part of the industry, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. and how it could be an advantage for you in some ways because you got written about. Tell me about the re the reception of the industry to you uh, in, a, in a fairly male dominant part of the of the well, industry. Well, there, there wasn't an industry per se. You know, there was this that, but it hadn't defined itself as an industry, really. Uh, well, the first. Well, I, I was I remember being in New York. I had um, six bottles in a little suitcase and waiting, you know, with all the reps at a store and got to uh, my place. And the owner of the store said, sorry, I can't see you. I'm going to uh, uh, the Bermudas, but you're a woman anyway. Voila. Um, otherwise, I think I'd been told by older growers here, always be dignified, have a sense of humor, but be dignified. So, you know, it was a question of, well, I wasn't a particularly provocative woman anyway, you know, I just, I just wasn't, um, you know, small, five foot and one half inch, and I suppose very intent on what I was doing. And you always wore, um, at least I always, you know, a suitcase if you're going cross country, and the Hudson is frozen in New York and it's hot in San Diego, you know, you had, a, you had to wear clothes that would sort of be adjustable, if you will. And so in general, I had a couple of bad, bad brushes and, um, you know, was able to laugh those off. And, and I, I, I didn't, it puzzles me to this day. I sort of didn't think of myself as a woman in the wine trade. I was a person and I was so motivated that I didn't see myself as, as a woman, you know, or, or I shouldn't be here. And I think one of those things was that my mother who was, was a very strong woman and just got up and did things when she had to, she'd been a, prima ballerina in Europe and then, you know, classical dance, no good. She moved from um, Hungary or Romania, it was, um, to Germany and had to cope with the likes of Isadora Duncan, whom she said, oh, stomping around, darling, just stomping, no style at all. And so she put on a show that ran for 10 years. And then my father, who uh, did have a firm on Wall Street, could not evolve. After the Second World War, he just simply could not evolve and his two brothers said bye bye so you know he went from you know I had a nanny and everything and uh so all of that changed and my mother had a ballet school but I think she's a bit tired to carry that on but when my father you know was no longer a wealthy fellow she just got up and went and found a job and I, that is eh, just don't complain just get up and do something do something. So nowadays it's it's just, though I've been a strong advocate for women's rights and equal pay and diversity and all of that, um, sometimes you, you, you have to get up and do something. You can't go blah, 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 blah. <laughs> so I was always treated, treated very well, I think. Um, as I say, a couple of bad brushes, but you know, as 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 the older people here would say, you know, you're you're in a world where people drink, and when people get drunk, people get drunk. So, voila, I did get drunk once in New Orleans with an absolutely fantastic woman who had the most marvelous hats. I mean, she was sort of like a character out of a Louisiana play. And after the tasting, she said, you know, we'll take you back to the hotel. And she and I polished off a whole bottle of Winston Churchill champagne. <laughs> and that was the one time I did get drunk. Luckily, I was staying in the hotel and could get myself up to my room. But that's, that was it. <laughs> well, if you're going to do it anywhere, New Orleans is the right place to do it, I think. I think so. so I think you were, <laughs> I think you chose right wisely. 
So yeah. you you had mentioned earlier the, that that uh, you had you kind of you had this import export business with a partner and, and a bankruptcy and and instead of being taken over, you set off on your own. So so tell me about that that moment. What what year are we in at that point? And, and, and we're how in um, eighty five eighty six. Okay. And how did you? So how did you? How did you get going on your own? What was what was the kind with of the fear and fear and trembling in a sympathetic banker. And, and um, you know, I mortgage, mortgages and all that kind of stuff. And then I had, you know, I, I just had a good team. Dominique Lafon, before he went back to his domain, worked with me and so on and so forth. We, we worked very, very hard. We worked very, very hard. And uh, there were ups and downs, ups and downs, but you learn from that. You really do learn. It's, it's sometimes I worry today that with social media, you can become a star in three minutes and then the downs are painful. And if one works in viticulture or agriculture of any kind, it's the weather that guides. It's not you. <laughs> Sorry. You might be incredibly talented and brilliant. And if it's going to rain all summer, you're going to make rainwater. You're not going to make wine, and so one learns from one learns from nature. Hmm. So, as as you started uh, your own company in, in the mid '80s, uh, to, to give me give us give us a quick rundown of, of how the business works. It's kind of a foggy area for some of us. So, how did your business work, and how did it evolve? Uh, by then, uh, you know, we had uh, importers in almost every state except a couple of the non-drinking states and uh, just continued, you know, said we're going out on our own and here is, you know, here is our list and would like very much to work with you. It was a lot of phone calling and then, of course, three to four trips a year cross country and tasting and seeing it. Uh, by then, people had begun very much. Um, to like Pinot Noir. Well, there was an interest, you know, in it, uh, Pinot Noir and Chardonnay and this, that, and the other thing. And uh, so uh, your importer uh, is the one who gave you orders. And then either you grouped with other of their suppliers or you put a container together. Mostly in the small states, it was, you know, grouping with somebody else. You prepared the wines. The wines had to be delivered in uh, oh, yes, this is very interesting. In order to export from France, people had to do things they'd never done before. You had a back label and you had an import strip. You had to submit labels for label approval and have that comma in the right place because otherwise the FDA in some state is going to say no, 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 no. So a lot of working out. I think we figured out 17 steps between the bottle and the seller and when it arrives on your uh, to you because it's paperwork booze is paperwork face it it's not easy and um so the order would you know you had to take into consideration a winemaker's year there are certain times you're not going to ask them to prepare wines when they're harvesting so all of that but that came in and then um little by little i had a super team and at one moment we were all women because we weren't having a nice time with you fellows. <laughs> we're an all woman company to boot because that sort of detail for us was part of it. You know, they say that women can think up and down, you know, you can think about um, changing the diaper at the same time as you're doing this. <laughs> and I guess it's true because all of that um, is extremely, extremely important. Extremely important. And then bit by bit, you built up a following. But it had a great deal to do with the hard work. You know, I, I remember I just was Googling some stuff and saw a tasting that we did with a New York importer at a um, store in uh, a restaurant in Brooklyn called London Lenny's. And it was great because the owner had given his staff time off for a tasting. So you had that kind of generosity that happened and you know people came with uh, uh you know notes and numbers 
And during all of this era, of course, uh, 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 era, of course um, suddenly wine became scored. Now, this was something that evidently commercially for people was marvelous um, for the people who bought the wine. But how you tell the difference between the 91 and the 92 is still beyond me. And then you had a certain number of critics with, um, you know, filtration became an issue. And there are years where you don't have to filter. And there are years where you really should. <laughs> but if I'm going to make my career on the back of filtration, that's a nasty word. The news is filtered this, that, or the other thing. And we have, at the moment, there is somebody who's made their reputation on ladybugs, you know, those nasty ones that gives you pyrazines. In fact, because it's spectacularly warm for this time of year, I have several of them crawling. And if you smell them, ooh, they are stinky. They are stinky bugs. But not every ladybug in the world had come to Burgundy and settled in on the tanks. You know, so we, you had to, in a sense, um, you had to, how can I put it, uh, try and get people to not listen or buy by the numbers. You, you, that was very important. And um, we, <laughs> I had someone who worked for me for a little while, fellow who uh, decided that scores, which, you know, Robert Parker was the one who put them. He wrote a very funny article pretending to be a Viennese psychiatrist and said, poor Mr. Parker, it's evident that he developed the system because he did not, as you Americans say, score when he was younger. <laughs> it was never published. <laughs> it will remain firmly tucked in your archives. But uh, that changed it because then people would look at the score and not read the description. This was not a good moment for the world of the world because because wine isn't a product, you know. And and I mean, it's even today, you know, when you've got natural wines and you know everything like that, um, it's not a product. You you're not going to uncork that and it will taste the same as it did yesterday and you know if one wants product it's another story it's another story so all of that you know very very interesting when i think gosh you know it's been 40 odd years a little bit over and the changes that i've seen it, you know the horse has come back to this that and the other thing you it's uh they no it's amazing the changes that have occurred So you talked about Pinot Noir uh, becoming popular dur during your time, yeah. and, and, and obviously uh, here in Oregon, that's that's sort of what we're part of that. So tell me about yeah. tell me about your first your first impression of Oregon or your first interaction with Oregon wine and and, and the early days of the industry. All right, my first visit to Oregon, um, I was flying from California, I think from San Francisco, and the fellow next to me said, "Do you have your passport?" And I looked at him and I said, I have my American passport. I live in France. He said, no, you need a visa to come to Oregon. And I realized that he was joking. He wasn't. He laughed. That was my first, very first trip to Oregon. And I've been looking in the archives. And if I can find something, I'll send it to you. But that must have been at the end of the 70s. You know, I started selling barrels in, say, 76, 77. And I think I got to Oregon, it would seem to me, probably in 78 or 79, and somebody had probably given me an introduction. It could have been to David Lett, or I tasted, you know, an Irie Vineyards and sort of went, ooh, gosh, this feels like home, you know? And um, so my first visit, and uh, it was, I can't remember if it was Dick Erath or, or, um, or David who took me around, and I remember the vineyards, you know, that, that, that I visited. I went to see the Ponzi's, uh, I think the Campbell's, uh, of course, uh, uh, Adelsheim, you know, his good friend, um, Erath, of course. And um, 
they all took me into the vineyard. I mean, they wanted me to see the vineyards because, you know, it's volcanic soil as opposed to, but it was really interesting. And then the wines, of course, you know, everyone with a different style, but the wines had the grace of a Pinot. I mean, even to me, if you if you have a very virile pomar, there's still kind of a grace in it. And then I realized, of course, the weather had a lot to do with it. They didn't have, you know, the intense sunlight um, and what have you. But what there was, was this, it, it was incredible. It was a region awakening. We can do this. You know, and part of it, of course, was good, you know, well, let's compete with, <laughs> with old California there. <laughs> they started out with, uh, you know, Zinfandel, <laughs> but we can do this. We have, and you had, uh, you know, back then quite an intelligent group of winemakers who hung out together and very much like the Burgundy of today, exchanged ideas. It, it wasn't, you know, this is me. <laughs> It wasn't that sort of thing at all. So my, my impression was one of even a very well-known grower here in Burgundy and in other regions in France. There's a sort of a humility vis-a-vis -vis their land, you know, and they know, uh, they know their, or back then, certainly they knew that they weren't going to be there forever and that what you hand on, you know, if it's been well taken care of. You know, it was Hubert de Monti who once said to a group of California winemakers, my vines were here before I was born. They will be here after I die. It's up to me to honor or dishonor them. It still gives me goosebumps when I hear him saying it to, uh, you know, uh, and, and, and that, yes, he was a lawyer and a beau parleur, as one says, but still, it's the attitude that you have here. I must hand on, I must hand on in better shape than when I, find, uh, when I found it. And, the, uh, and I felt that, I just, I just felt that very strongly. And in Oregon, when I got there, it was a different place. It was a different place. Mm. So then, you know, you, you, you started with, uh, I can't remember what year the first international Pinot, was it 80, what was the yeah, first? I believe year? 87, I believe. 87, wasn't it? Yeah. And by then, you know, you had Oregon winemakers coming here and visiting and tasting. And uh, th there was a sort of a, um, it was very, there was a bond. You know, there, there, there was a bond. And I remember Jason Lett spent a good part of a summer here and there was just a bond. And I remember Dick Erath, um, <laughs> my, my sink <laughs> got all messed up. And, and he, you know, just said, you have a wrench? Yep, bump, bump, and he did it. And then um, he uh, <laughs> was, was teaching my sons to play baseball in the backyard and stuff. So there was this very warm feeling. Very warm feeling. And history to write instead of inherit. You know, because in California, you did have, you know, vines brought, brought by the missionaries and what have you, but it was all. And then in 83, this incredible visit with the Potels from Pustor and with the Lafarges. And I have the book, I'm going to, I promise this is a big book. And there's like 10 pages on Oregon. And I took growers to visit there. And I, you, you're going to say that it wasn't staged. We were out in the vineyards with, with Let, and that bloody bird flies over the way the one he's got on the label. And they were saying, David, did you stage this? Do you have a pet eagle or whatever it was? But there was a warmth. There was a warmth. And they just had through through a big dinner for us and everything, and you you could tell you know there, there, there was great curiosity when we visited California, but um, there was more of a comradeship 
in Oregon. They 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 felt they understood uh, what the what what Pino certainly was doing there. It was happy there. You know, it was happy there. So uh, that was it. And then just many funny things. Uh, I think for one of the early conferences, uh, the IP, uh, yeah, they had invited Clive Coates to be guest star. And Russell and I, Russell is my dearly beloved husband of over 30 years. And um, we were there with, <laughs> with Clive. And Clive was going to Oregon. He was going to speak in, in Oregon, you know, that kind of stuff. And he's on a panel or leading a panel and he's on a stage. And Russell and I are staring with him because the man has on a bloody pair of Bermuda shorts and you could see up them. And we'd said, Oregon is not, <laughs> it's a very intelligent, sophisticated place. And we're waving at Clive. <laughs> but, uh, and then you had a great exchange of growers going to Oregon, as you know now, I mean, you know, the Druas have bought, people have bought. But it took this generation that I met it took that generation to put up with the, you know, the, the ups and downs that people have. And the wine's just lovely. I, I put one in a, not the famous Paris tasting because I didn't know anybody back then, um, except Stephen Spurrier, but uh, uh, I think it was a go and me tasting. And of course, <laughs> the let Pinot beat out uh, Grand Cru, Burgundian Grand Cru, and the tasting was redone here in Bone, same thing happened. Which meant that Pino loved it. Pino absolutely loved it up in Oregon. It was right or the right rootstocks or, you know, whatever. It was, it was a combination of a number of forces. So, you know, that was my, it was just very exciting. It was very exciting. That's a that's a pretty notable contribution to Oregon's wine story, of course. Uh, what what was it about that wine that that made you? What did you see in it that made you want to enter it in that kind of competition? I honestly, it wasn't that specific. I said I said to David, send me a couple of bottles of your best. And it's the you know which, which then again has to do with vintage. What has evolved the best? We weren't quite as talkative back then, probably as one is today. You know, um, I can't quite explain it, but uh, one didn't have to, you know, defend the consistency of the soil or how much sulfur you use or you don't use, or whether it's a glue glue wine or if you want to put it down. Um, language was simpler. Simpler, and you, you had, as I, all I can tell you is, as I get old, um, I'm less interested in taking apart a wine. You, you know, I want it to speak to me, right, then if somebody insists, then you can have fun and, you know, do all your tricks. But I want a general impression of stability, of balance of this, that, and the other thing. And uh, so, as I say, language, no, everyone was, was, was very interested. You could spend hours um, talking with Dave Adelson about, you know, bits and pieces. And Erath, Erath was, and still is, because he only came here, gosh, it was evidently before COVID, you know, walking with his canes. And, but it was incredible to see him again. And I think I had an older, Erath, I have bottles left over from my barrel selling days and I may have pulled that out for him or something because there is something very interesting. Uh, Oregon wines do age well, if they're well made. Now I'm not, I don't know the new crowd or anything like that, but I can tell you that, you know, the people I first met and if I have a bottle or two that are now very old, they have aged very, very well. Mm. 
So you mentioned the the Druin family obviously earlier and, and their investment in Oregon, uh, which is many have seen as kind of a direct result of, of David Lett's success in, in those wine competitions and other Oregon wine success. Tell me about, in your recollection, the, the French reaction to those competitions and, and to Oregon's success. What was the reaction uh, of the Burgundian winemakers and, and, and how did, what did they do? What did they do as a result of that reaction? Uh, nothing much. I mean, it wasn't like, you know, a headline in the paper, you know, or at least in the local paper, there was not a headline, but it was talked about. And uh, the people, you know, who did have uh, um, funds and could not buy more vineyards here certainly began to look upon Oregon as a place to expand. And then one very interesting thing, um, I have a, a, a friend in New York who, who extraordinary, um, uh, he works for a, a store called Flatiron. And he was talking to uh, Louis-Michel Lise Belair, who also, you have a lot of guest winemakers from France in Oregon at the moment. And Louis-Michel had told him there is terroir in Oregon. And I can point it out to you, it's here, it's there it's there and it's there. So an awakening of the fact that it just wasn't, uh, that there was a reason for all of this and the word terroir is so misused now. I mean, you use it for carrots, you use it, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, use it for everything it has, marketing word. But um, so I think the people who did visit saw it as a future place to purchase vines. And, you know, one, one, because, you know, the usual story was Josh Jensen and Colera, who Josh had spent a long time uh, here um, in Burgundy and limestone, of course, is what he looked for. And of course, found the right place, the right temperature, so on and so forth. But uh, you, you saw uh, an awakening interest in, should we, for some reason or another, should we lose our domain because of family reasons, what have you? Let's think about Oregon, it became a go-to possibility. Mm. So you mentioned, uh, you mentioned the, the kind of importance of hospitality from, from a very young age for yourself, uh, the, fr the food and the, co the cooking and the wine and, and, and that. Tell me about the role that, that hospitality has played in your business and the role that you and, and, and your husband and your family have played in, in kind of growing oh. <laughs> that, through that. Well, when I, I was, um, I was exiled from where I live now for a bit and a friend lent me a house and I didn't have any money but I could do 20 different ways of serving people lentils so part of it was always um it's here you know it's expensive to take customers out for meals you, you, you'd rather if, if you can you know pay your team well and um so um cook-ins became because also when, when you cook in uh, you can serve the wines you want and you know sort of set them up with the food that would be good and my husband Russell Hone is a chef an incomparable chef and I happily laid down my spatula when I learned that he could cook and it's I live in a barn it's an old barn it's very beautiful but it's not a house it's it's it has a huge barn room and that's where people sit and eat. I mean, all right, COVID has changed it all for the time being. So people came here to eat and in the offices, which are in Bone, um, very often if there's somebody there, they'll stay for lunch. Everybody on the team cooks. We're all a bit food mad. Um, because as I said, you know, it's very interesting to taste a wine on its own and muse and think about it and so on and so forth. But it's not, the only destiny of the wine. So tell me about, you, you talked about the, the changes you've seen in, in wine and, and, the, and, so, and some, sort of some cyclical things you've seen come back. Tell me no. what the, the biggest changes you've seen are in, in, the, in the wine industry. And that can be in, in a specific wine region or just kind of in general in wine. What are the biggest changes you've seen in the industry as, as your business has grown and your interest has grown um, in, in your time in the industry? Social media. social media because um, from, you know, the <laughs> leather bound order books that one used to use, I mean, it was by hand and by mail, 
uh, it's um, a new idea can become popular in three months. And it's, uh, I'm, not, I'm not talking about, you know, um, Iry Vineyards, uh, I mean, uh, Jason posts almost every day, but they're photographs or they're, you know, you, you're walking through vineyards, they're, they're, they're not, uh, hey, look at me. But the hey, look at me sort of thing, one has to take into account that it appeals to a certain generation. Uh, it's uh, tradition bores the life out of them and they need an extra, I mean, look, look how quickly um, organic, biodynamic, all of which are marvelous because we have to take care of the planet, we really do, uh, it's very important. But um, to exclude a wine because a grower uh, who is intelligent and has done a, little, a lot of research is going to use a copper spray for mildew. A very interesting thing happened. We were down in the south looking for some wines from the south. And, uh, and they said, but what are you going to do in Burgundy should there be a disease? Because your vines are so close together. We're ours because we had to pull out so many vines, you know, are, uh, we're, we're, we're more protective than you, which is why we have more old vines than you do theoretically. Now, this is a very interesting question because it will occur in Oregon as well. Um, what, how far do you go? Do you say if you have a child who is ill, I am not going to use antibiotics because I don't believe in that sort of chemistry. And, you know, the books written about it, that, you know, people said, no, 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 I won't do it, I won't do it. But these are the enormous questions, enormous questions, you know, for the future. And because you have social media, which in an odd way, you're not responsible. I mean, you don't have to face the person you've just said, this person is an idiot, you know, you're there and so on and so forth. Also, it builds up a domain. And then I never knew, I'm, I'm, I'm just getting involved with, you know, today's words. Uh, that there was something called a cancel culture. And that there were domains because they said the wrong thing, that I'm not gonna buy that one. So I think this is, I, uh, and marketing out of hand, um, the positive side of it, of course, is that people can communicate with each other. And this is a very positive side, but the uh, so-called cancel culture, uh, which has affected certain demands. So one, and today everything's open. We don't know what is in a bottle of, well, let's say 1937. But today everything has to be sworn to, signed, boom, 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 boom. And we're going, oh, that's absolutely gorgeous. And yet you don't know if they didn't mix different you you just don't know and today is so i think that's the the biggest change i've seen uh in one way another way is certainly here in burgundy uh that there was a whole generation that came to terms with the fact that the soil in certain cases had been overtreated and immediately set to correcting that. So now you have, you, you, you have, I would say that Burgundy is highly organic, highly organic. And it's the, the, the best of the younger generation, I'm talking about people you know in their, their 30s and 40s, um, are doing an immense amount of very onerous hand sort of, you know, there's a disease, cut it out, don't spray it take a knife and cut it out and imagine how. <laughs> I think that we all have to be careful in whatever country um, to keep wines at a price. I'm not talking about the few Grand Cru's where you know everybody in the world wants one, but uh, uh, that despite all the 
onerous inheritance laws here, They're very difficult. Um, and I think that wine must remain at least, you know, at some level so that my favorite Mr. and Mrs. Smith can buy a bottle. Uh, that I've seen prices, you know, go up and up. And, and for also for some of the top Oregon wines, you know, there comes that, I suppose, desirable collector's bottle. And I think those are the biggest, the biggest changes that I've seen. The work remains the same. I mean, you still have to prune, you still have to. <laughs> I haven't seen a pruning robot yet. There are pruning harvest machines. I mean, not pruning ones, but you know, harvesting machines. They're kind of cute, but, <laughs> but. Uh, mm. So then what do you see as you look ahead for, for wine? What, what will come next uh, in Burgundy, in, in Oregon, or, or just sort of in general? What, what are some of the general. things you see on the horizon? I think it will, the language will calm down a bit so that it will speak once again to, you know, historically there has always been wine. You know, there's always been wine. And I think that there will be less fuss about it. It's very interesting to know the geology, but it's not interesting, you know, when I go and buy a loaf of bread, I don't particularly want to know where the flour was made. Sometimes I do, I want to know it's, you know, local and so on and so forth. But I think it will get less fancified. And, and you know, from what um, we've just in the last couple of years, you know, nobody drinks Sauterne anymore. Why? I mean, yes, if you put soda in it. And yet you have this, this entirely respectable appellation, which is wonderful. And people are beginning to almost, you know, whisper like they're flashers or something. I drink so turn to you. Uh, yeah, I like it with dessert, <laughs> you know, it's, it's pretty good. So I see swings going, you know, back and forth. I see that, that some things have been pushed over the top. I'm, some, I learned from um, you know, some people in Texas and some of and what have you, that the younger crowd are so tired of the word Chardonnay, they could scream. And they've all moved to Chenin Blanc where the prices are good and it's a region that's coming back. But the Loire existed before, you know, the Loire was there and then it went out of fashion, overproduction certainly in some of the vines and what have you. Mm -hmm. Alsace should be on its way back soon. <laughs> but they're cycles, that's what I've learned. All in New Oak, you know, people in, apparently in Coca-Cola were considering a Coca-Cola in New Oak thing at the time. Trends come and go. And then the strength of a region does, it's been there for a long time. And, you know, and Oregon has the wonderful, wonderful thing of, you know, sort of like the Vikings who arrived and we're going to plant Pino and other interesting cepage. And it just, the timing was so good. Oh my heavens. It was really wonderful. And then, and then you have, as you do in any viticultural region, you have people who set good examples, winemakers who set good examples for younger crowds coming in. Yeah, I mean, where's Jason Let's Rolls Royce? And, you know, where's his, <laughs> where's a movie star giving her his or her name to a Q? No, you know, not, not happening not happening and talk about someone using social media for for interest for good and and, and always you know it's his region you you you, you can see that the landscape the, I, I i watch his instagram through almost daily and you know you, you you see the land you see you don't see hi i'm jason <laughs> i want you to drink you know <coughs> it's fascinating though it's fascinating that brings up an interesting point that I'd like your I'd like your opinion on. Um, you mentioned kind of Oregon before before self almost Oregon before your own brand. 
um, as Oregon became a brand, as Oregon became a region, um, was that unique, something fairly unique to you and in, in your knowledge of other regions in terms of building themselves as, as a group rather than each individual brand trying to monkey yeah. in the place? Yeah, it was, it was certainly uh, uh, different. It was certainly different. There, there was certainly the, the domains that the estates that I first knew, they, they weren't competing against each other. You know, I suppose it's like here in Burgundy, when you've got outsiders who come in and, you know, purchase land and what have you, then uh, another um, motive seems to come in. But you found, you found that in certain, you find that always have in certain villages in Burgundy or in other places where they, you know, one, <laughs> you don't have competition within, but you have people uh, um, really doing well by the appellation. And, um, but it's very nice to see. It's very, very nice to see. And, and uh, I think that's part of Oregon's strength. I really do, really, really do. I mean, I don't know the new crowd at all, so I'm not qualified to, you know, judge or anything. But um, I think it was a unique, a unique moment, certainly in my life. Absolutely unique. And, you know, just let's stories of where he was going to plant. You know, he didn't do pay millions of dollars to analyze the soil and find out where to put that first vine. Well, there's, there's, you know, lovely place. And doing well. And, and um, also, Linfield has, you've done a lot. You've done a lot to, you know, preserve the um, um, heritage, but also to bring people over here, bring young people over here in, in, in the right way, in the right way. And, and uh, always, I mean, Russell and I were just reminiscing about, I just, odd Oregonian bit. There was, we met a doctor, his name was Dr. John Porter. This was a hundred years ago. And he was a specialist in vascular surgery. He was the one who helped the Rion family find a surgeon for a rare operation that their daughter had to do. There's this sort of thing in Oregon. When um, my business was shivering, um, I had shareholders from Oregon. They, no, you know, um, there, there's a sort of a, um, there's a character. I mean, maybe that first man I met who laughingly told me I needed a passport, you know, perhaps he meant, uh, <laughs> perhaps he meant that. Is, I mean, is, is it true or am I imagining that there is a sort of, you, you, you can talk about a Midwestern character, but Oregon and Washington are two different places, I think. I would, I would agree with that. <laughs> there's, yeah. there's, there's, there's a Northwest, but there's also an Oregon, I think. And, yeah, yeah. yeah. Voila. <laughs> <laughs> um, you had mentioned a couple of times during this interview, obviously, we're, we're speaking via Zoom uh, for, for travel reasons, but also because there is a pandemic going on right now, and, and we're all kind of stuck where we are. Um, yeah. tell, me, tell me about, uh, from your perspective, the effects that the pandemic has had on the industry and, and on, um, on growers and on sellers. And where, as we start to come out of this, hopefully soon, where you see the industry, how you see it bouncing back? Woo, a good question. I'm very sad about the hundreds, hundreds, hundreds of small restaurants that will not survive it. Uh, I think that perhaps the flashy bits will not come back. It, to me, just before the pandemic slapped us in the face, it was like a dance that had gone wild. Faster, 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 and then everybody fall down. Um, the way probably of marketing and selling wine is going to change. Perhaps these massive trade tastings where you never, you know, it, it's just to put your, your wares on show. It's going to be different. There'll be, will be more thoughtful, uh, but certainly I don't think that what was happening before 
will continue. I think there's going to be a little bit less reliance on the so-called tastemakers. And I think that retail certainly has survived and in fact benefited, you know, from all of this. I, I, I think that uh, perhaps there will be more emphasis on the revival of the retailer because for a while it was mostly restaurants, really where the name was made for a while. And I just, I just think it's going to be a, a different, uh, the virtual tastings, are, it's not the same thing. People need to, you know. So I, I think that will be replaced by, you know, conviviality and people dining together again and so on and so forth. But the industry also has, it has uh, brought, during the, the pandemic where you, you can't really see people, I think wine is no longer considered to be entirely elite or only for the, you know, uh, I'm never going to drink wine, look at them, you know, can of beer in the hand, that's what a real person drinks. So I think that's beginning to calm down. I think that perhaps the, the accessory rage may calm down a bit, that you don't have to have, you know, the cellar designed and made for you by Picasso with, uh, you know, all of that sort of thing will, I think some of the side industries may calm down a little bit. It, it will be there, but, but in everything that we do, we think, we say we've all been given a big, a big fat slap. And it's worldwide thing, it's not just us. I think people will be probably more thrifty if you, you, you have a choice between, uh, you know, sending a donation to Oxfam or, it, it has to, there's going to have to be more in it. I think the, not the industry, let's say the, the, the domains as a whole, you know, universally, are trying very hard to contribute to the safeguard of the planet, you know, not using poison. Now there's a lot of stuff that's currently being talked about, uh, the use of glass and the carbon footprint and, and what have you. Now, there are certainly wines that can be done in cartons or paper bags or cans or stuff like that. I think what is going to get a slap is the idea of aging a wine. And that's because a lot of people uh, woke up and their life had changed. And they're saying it can happen again. This may be the first. So perhaps it may change styles or the thought that you have to lay down the wine for 20 years. Yes, delicious, yes, incredible. But uh, maybe we shouldn't worry about that after the pandemic. So a lot of thought, a lot of thought. One doesn't stop thinking, that's for sure. Mm. Mm. Very, a very interesting perspective. Thank you for that. That's an, an excellent, like you say, thoughtful. We've all had to do a lot of thinking and I, I appreciate it. Oh, we have, we have, we have. Hmm. But, uh, so, so as you look back uh, on your interesting and and, and uh, career in wine, uh, what are you proudest of? I think actually developing the systems. I mean, there's been there's been a lot of you know marvelous moments that, that, that just you know are incredible. Somebody you love, you know, they're not going to live for a long time, you pull out your best bottle and you share it together. But I think the thing was that there was no system for small, for small estate. And that I learned, as I say, from the barrels. So I think that's really if, if <laughs> you know, I was a grouper, I wasn't a groupie, I was a grouper. <laughs> but that permitted small estates to be sold because you know a container has so many cases in it all right you've got to pick up this from here that from there if you're working with small estates if you're working with a, a large company no it fills up the container and bye-bye and then you know one 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 had to explain that if you miss uh 
a container, the container misses the boat, and then it has to wait, you know, for another shipment. And what if the importer in, I don't know, Missouri, isn't going to have a second container? Now, people are, you know, beginning to set up businesses which do this kind of thing, but the impossibility of a small state shipping to the United States was um, um, until, and that, and that I must, you know, thank the, the Coopers for that because we had to work out the system for that as well. And without a system, everything is lost. <laughs> That's what I'm proudest of. And very delighted to still be, you know, <laughs> here when I watch the current generation and, and I see what they are doing. I, it, it is so remarkable in terms of the viticulture is so remarkable and such hard work. But um, that's what you see today, this total, you know, what we would call a prise de conscience of what we must do. You know, it's, it's up to me to honor or dishonor my vineyard. <laughs> and you see that, you know, with good, growers in Australia, you see that in Germany, you see, you, you see a lot of that conscience, you know, taken, not, not for publicity's sake. Because, you know, there can be, as in everything, a lot of, uh, <laughs> you sign up to something and it's not really because you want to get out and, with your pocket knife and so anyway, but that these are words of an old woman, you know. One last question for you. I'm, I'm really curious to hear your answer on this. We like to ask this as a closing question in our interviews. Yes. Um, what is the role of wine in the society? Wine eases everything. A glass of wine and you sit and you can have all sorts of thoughts. I don't care if it's about the geology. I don't care if it just mellows you. But wine has always had a part in society. It can be celebratory. It can be, you just want to sit and, you know, not even talking about bottles, but a glass of wine is something that just makes life better. And people in every country, every country have had the experience. You know, they've always been English vineyards, but it's, um, who was it that said, to drink a glass of wine is something like a drop of human history. I think it was Clifton Fadiman. I, I, I like what people have written about it, but it eases things, it welcomes. It, it gives you just a little moment of, you know, you lift, and, and you don't have to have it in the most expensive wine glass in the world. You know, it's just that it, it makes it all better somehow, unless it's terrible wine, at which moment you can. <laughs> but good wine, let's preface it, a, a good glass of wine, a glass of good wine, just, I just, I think dry martinis are very sophisticated, but it doesn't do the same thing, does it? <laughs> it just doesn't do the same thing. Hmm. Anyway. I love that. That's, that's wonderful. I love that. Well, that's all the questions that I have for you. Is there, well, is there anything, you. anything we didn't cover today that we should have covered? Anything I didn't ask you that I should have asked? No, I, if you asked me certain things, I wouldn't have told you. So no. <laughs> I think we've done, I think we've done a good job. Wonderful. Well, thank you so, so much for joining us and for sharing your story in history. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and let you off the hook. Thank you so much, Becky. That was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. A pleasure.